Um, to leave enough time at the end of class, get out here at 10.05, so 9.55 is probably about what I'll give it. <coughs> this is over, uh, the quiz is over kind of the background to Shakespeare that was in the book and a little bit that I discussed in class. Um, and it says Acts 1 and 2. I'm trying to remember if I have anything from later than that. I don't think I do. It's 10, uh, it's ten questions and five extra credit <coughs> points. And I'm hoping my voice is going to last. Okay, so we're picking up. I said we would pick up, I think I said we would pick up with Act 2. Um, I want to back up for just a say just a moment, it'll probably be 10 minutes. Um, Helena's closing speech <clears throat> at the end of Act 1. It's Act 1, Scene 2. Helena gets a speech where she's the only character on stage. When you have a character who's alone on stage deliver a speech, you have a soliloquy, okay? And in a soliloquy, what the character speaks is what the character believes to be true. That is, we're essentially seeing inside that person's mind. We're, hear we're hearing exactly what that person believes, whatever is true, okay? A character in a soliloquy never lies because up here, how often do you lie to yourself? Even if you've, you know, done something horrendous, you know you've done it, and you, you can't, you know, lie to yourself about it, okay? So she delivers this soliloquy. <coughs> well, what's the soliloquy about? It begins on page, or it's on page 1553. It begins around line 226, okay? And the brief introduction, she has just talked with Hermia and Lysander. They've told her that they are going to, the next day, run off to the wood to get married, okay? So they leave, and she's left alone. And she's thinking about not Hermia and Lysander. She's thinking about the person she loves, Demetrius. And she's kind of going in her mind what she's going to do, okay? And she tells us. How happy some or other some can be. That is, how happy some can be while others are unhappy. Okay? Who's happy, obviously, in this scene? Hermia and Lysander. They're happy not because of what's happened previously in the act, but because of what they're planning to do tomorrow. They're going to run off and have their happily ever after. Okay? Who's unhappy? Okay, kind of everyone else, but not literally. I mean, Theseus and Apollota, they're looking forward to getting married in four days. Aegeus isn't very happy right now. His daughter's disobeying him, okay? Helen is definitely not happy. She loves Demetrius. He doesn't love her anymore. <coughs> so she says, Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. Who's the she? Hermia. Okay? But what of that? Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. If we were to go around and take a poll of the Athenian people, most people would go, yeah, Helen is as hot as Hermia is. But what of that? In other words, big deal, right? What does it matter? Why? Demetrius thinks not so. It doesn't matter what everybody out there thinks. Demetrius doesn't think I'm as fair as Hermia. He will not know what all but he do know. He, the will there is instructive because it might mean volition. He chooses. He chooses not to know. Okay? Not to see. Not to understand. <coughs> what everybody else does see and understand. What does everybody else see and understand? I'm as good-looking as Hermia. He, Demetrius, doesn't see that. He chooses not to. Okay? And then notice her next line. And as he errs, as some people pronounce it, errs, he's wrong. 
She's saying he's wrong for not seeing I am as attractive as Hermia. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes. Why does he err? Why doesn't he see Helena as being as beautiful as Hermia? Because he dotes on her eyes. She's apparently got gorgeous eyes. That's one way of reading it. Or, what else can it mean? What happens when you look in somebody's eyes closely? What do you see? Yourself. You see your reflection in their eyes. Maybe that's what's causing the doting. Maybe he's not in love with Hermia as much as he's in love with the idea of being in love. Okay? So, she says, as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, that is, I also err, I'm also in mistaken here. Why? Admiring of his qualities, his qualities. Those things about him that most women would go, pretty, pretty good. She's saying he's wrong because he looks solely at Hermia's eyes. And I'm kind of wrong in the same way because I look at his qualities. <clears throat> Notice what she's admitting here. I'm a damn fool just like he is. Okay. Things base and vile. holding no quantity. And your gloss tells you quantity means shape or form. I don't think that's really what it means. Holding no quantity. Un unsubstantial, unshaped. No, unsubstantial means it doesn't have substance. Okay? It's, it's not what it means. Things base and vile means things very common, very low, very ordinary, okay? Holding no quantity, that is, not having a beautiful shape, not having something that would attract the eye because they're so common in peck hall, right? I would call it something base and vile. It's common. It's ordinary. It's actually not. It's out of the ordinary ugly. I mean, it's extraordinarily ugly. It's what's called brutalist architecture. It's designed to kill you, to kill your soul. I mean, look at this. Look at these walls. How freaking ugly can you get? I mean, you can put something over them to make them better. All right? So, things base and vile, having no quantity, that is, having no shape, no form, no design to attract your eye, Love can transpose to form and dignity. Love can transform. It can change those base low things to form. It can make those things look beautiful and give them dignity. What's a real example of what she's talking about? Have you ever heard of the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Give me an example of that. Have you ever known a couple where you look at the guy and you look at the girl and go, how in the world? How, how did things low, base, and vile, he end up with her? Or the other way around. In the president's cabinet, there's a, a member of his cabinet. He's the secretary of the treasury. He's just kind of dorky looking dude. I mean, your average run of the mill, dorky looking white guy. And he's got this drop dead gorgeous swimsuit model wife. I mean, you look at him, you go, what? That's exactly what Helena is talking about. How so? Because, use that example, the hot, gorgeous swimsuit model wife looks at base and vile and transforms it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
What does the beholder do? It takes something that most other people go, not beautiful, and they say, but you don't see him the way I see him. Or you don't see her the way I see her. Look at what she's going to say. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. <clears throat> she doesn't mean that literally, because we do look through the eyes. But she says, love doesn't say only what's beautiful is what all the eyes say is beautiful. After all, go back to the beginning of her speech. She says, most people say, I'm a sphere of Serbia. But in Demetrius' mind, she's not. Why? Because Demetrius looks at Hermia and he transforms Hermia more beautiful than Helen. But she's not talking about Demetrius and Hermia here. She's talking about herself in Demetrius. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Valentine's Day is coming up. You'll see Valentine's, and they've got the stupid little fat cherubic baby, you know, with his bow and arrow. Cupid doesn't say, however, I think... You ought to fall in love with you, and therefore, bing, bing. Uh -uh. Cupid's like Stevie Wonder. He's blind as a bat. Cupid doesn't aim at people. Cupid just, and people are struck blindly by love. Okay? So she says, that's why Cupid's painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. That is, love, she's saying, isn't something that can be reasoned out. That is, how many of you currently are or have been in love before? Oh, you don't have to show your hands. I'm assuming probably everybody has. Okay? How did you, quote unquote, fall in love? Did you look at that person and go, I've got to get a legal pad, and I've got to write down pros and cons. Why I'm going to love. Bang. No! That's rational. That's reasonable. You do that maybe for deciding, you know, buying a car, buying a house, something like that. Not falling in love. Notice the phrase we use. You Fall in. What does that mean? You fall in love. It's unintentional. It's it's accidental. It's like you trip, and then you're there, <laughs> and you can't really help it, right? Because when you trip, you can't help it. It happens. So, she says, skipping a few lines. Ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye. Her eyes. That's the old plural for eyes. Okay? That's why we still have the word swine. It indicates more than one pig. Okay? Same kind of principle. Before he looked at her eyes, what? He hailed down those that he was only mine. Well, we heard about that earlier. Because like Sandra <laughs> said, before Demetrius loved Hermia, he made love to Nadar's daughter. He spoke beautiful words. He wooed her, etc. She's saying, before he loved Hermia, he loved me first. <clears throat> and when this hail, some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I'm going to go tell him. I'm going to go tell him, she says, what Hermia and Lysander are planning. Why? then he'll go off to the woods tomorrow night and he'll pursue her and for this intelligence that is this information I'm going to give him if I have thanks it is a dear expense dear costly that is he might offer me thanks and it'll be worth what I have to pay for it what is it she's gonna pay for it she's gonna follow him around she's not saying he's gonna go oh Helena thank you I was so wrong for being in love with Hermia. She knows he's not going to do that. Okay? 
but herein mean I to enrich my pain. And enrich my pain can mean two things. It can mean to make my pain even richer, to increase my amount of pain, or <coughs> it can mean to pay me for my pain, to, to get what I'm deserved, to get what I'm owed for the pains I'm going to put forth. What's, what's going to do that? To have his sight thither and back again. Thither, away, okay, away where? Hermia, and back. Notice the emphasis in the speech on sight. What can sight do? Think of the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Louder? It can fool you? What else? Do you mean by fool you, if we say beauty is in the sight of the beholder, and we find somebody who's gorgeous who falls in love with somebody who's ugly, does that mean that that person is fooled? Or that person is a fool? What does it mean? Maybe they see things we don't see. She's saying the exact same thing at the end. She's going to follow him. Why? Because whenever he is in sight of her, he is transformed in her eyes. So that when we see, in a few minutes, when we see them go off into the forest, and he says, go away, I don't love you. She just kind of, you know, laps that up. Why? Because at least he's talking to her. At least he's looking at her. She's deeply, madly, wildly in love, right? Or totally infatuated. You define the terms. So, scene two, we're going to largely skip. Scene two introduces <coughs> what are sometimes called the rude mechanicals or the rustics or the clowns. They're not clowns. Clowns is derogatory in that, in, in that usage. Who are these guys? Well, what do we see them do in this scene? Yeah, they're going to put on a play. They're going to put on a play within the play. They're going to put on a play at the end of the play. What's the purpose of that play? It's to help celebrate Theseus and Apollo's wedding. Because Theseus said to Philostrate earlier, rouse up the Athenian youth so that they can put on some revels for our, mar our wedding night. You know, jugglers and you know things like that. So these guys are going to do that. What is their what are their day jobs? Are they regularly actors? No. no. We have Nick Bottom, the weaver. Quince, the joiner, I think. I can't remember what each of them actually does. They come in, and we're told, Quince, the carpenter, Snug, the joiner, Bottom, the weaver, Flute, the bellows mender, Snout, the tinker, Starveling, the tailor. Every one of those employments is what? You have to go to a college to, to learn how to do those? No. They're skilled trades. You apprentice, and then you become a journeyman, and after seven more years, you become a master. That is, to become a master carpenter, you've got to be in the job, <coughs> if you're following the traditional timeline, minimum 14 years. Seven years as an apprentice. That is, you don't get paid, usually. And then you become a master, and a journeyman, then you become a, a master. And it's like that for every one of those jobs. They're all skilled trades. These guys are good with their hands. Not so much with their heads. Okay? According to the um, portrayal that we're given. Okay? So they're going to put on a play. And at it, scene two, I mean, how do they come across us? Especially Bottom. He's a moron. Because Peter Quince is handing out parts, and what does Bottom keep saying? I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do them all. Now, actors have put on 
one person plays before where actors have done all the parts. There's a version of Hamlet. You can watch it. I think it's on YouTube. Kevin Klein, pretty good actor, does it all. He does a one-man version of Hamlet. Patrick Stewart did a one-man version of A Christmas Carol. Not a play originally, but he, he does it all. Okay, Good actors can do that. Bottom's not a good actor. He's just someone who has a huge ego. Okay? So, act two. With act two, we get introduced to the fairies in the fairy realm. <coughs> Puck comes out, and we find out who Puck is. <coughs> He's the right-hand fairy. He's the head honcho for Oberon, king of the fairies, okay, who is married to Titania, queen of the fairies. Now, notice you have a fairy realm and you have the human realm. Who's at the top of the human realm in this play? Duke Theseus and Hippolyta, queen of the Amazon. So they represent the pinnacle of human society. And then beneath them, you've got Aegeus, his daughter, Lysander, Demetrius, Helena. They're kind of aristocracy. And then beneath them, you've got the wooden mechanicals, okay? The everyday workers of society, all right? We have the same kind of distinction in the fairy realm. We've got king and queen, okay? Puck is kind of the aristocracy if you want, of the fairy realm. And then we have all the little low life, so to speak, common fairies. Peas blossom and cobweb and mustard seed and characters like that. Okay? So, what are we introduced to in Act 2, Scene 1? Let me rephrase that. What we're introduced to in Act 2, Scene 1 parallels what we're introduced to in Act 1, Scene 1. Act 1, Scene 1 begins with there's a marriage coming, right? And then what's the conflict that enters? Okay. Aegeus comes in with his daughter, right? He wants his daughter to marry Demetrius. She wants to marry Lysander. That is, there's a problem in a love relationship. Act 2, scene 1, what do we see? Very quickly. There's a problem in a love relationship. Only that one's not a not yet consummated love relationship. That's a marriage. And it's the marriage of the king and queen of the fairies. These are like gods and goddesses. We're going to see in the course of the play, we're going to be told, because of the problems in this relationship, that's why there are problems in these relationships. Because there are problems in this relationship, there are also, we can extend to the natural world, there are problems in the natural world. Okay? We'll talk about that later. So, what's the problem in the marriage, the relationship of Oberon and Titania? Do they just not love each other anymore? Did one of them wake up one morning and go, I think it's time to move on. Let's have an amicable, amicable, you know, breakup. It's, no. I think it's pretty clear they do still love each other. It's why they fight so much. It's overall is bad. He's not getting enough attention from Titania. Because she goes and gets that Close. Kid, that kid, right? She's got that kid. Well, who's that kid? He's referred to as a little changeling child, okay? The son, she says, of a votress of her order. That is, this is the child of a woman who kind of worshipped Katanga. Okay? The woman apparently is dead. So Titania's has taken the child, and she's going to raise him to be one of her followers. And Oberon wants that boy to be one of his henchmen. He says, give me the boy and everything will be 
funny. And she says, not for your very kingdom. I wouldn't exchange this child for your entire kingdom. It's a pretty strong blanket statement, right? Okay. <coughs> so, because of that, there's ripples. It's like dropping a stone in a still pond. And the ripples go outward and outward. And they affect everybody throughout the play. So, what does Oberon say at that point? When she says no... And Oberon says, line 147 or so, page 1560. <coughs> Oberon says, Go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. And while they were talking, they each accused each other not quite of infidelity, but close. He says, I know why you're here. You're in this wood for the simple reason that Theseus is getting married and you favor Theseus. She goes, come off it, man. Don't tell me you're not here because of Hippolyta, okay? that is queen of the Amazons, and you favor her. And he's like, hardly, you know. And they go back and forth. So she says, I will away from hence. Okay? She says, I'm going to stay away from your bed too, so there's no, no sex going on. So that's why he says, Fine, you're not going to leave this wood until I torment you. I mean, I'm, I'm going to terrorize you for this. Okay? So he addresses Puck. And he says, you remember that one time when I sat on that promontory and I heard them made, etc. And you remember that flower? You remember Cupid shot his arrow and the arrow hit a flower, and therefore the flower became infused with the power of love? And Pop's like, yeah. He says, go bring me that flower. And he tells us what he's going to do. I'm going to take that flower and I'm going to put that juice into Tanya's eyes, so that when she wakes up, she's going to fall wildly, madly in love with it, whatever it is she sees. Notice how that connects with what Helena said in her soliloquy. What can the eye or mind do? It can make beautiful what it looks at through love. Okay? So, he says, line 170 following, The juice of it on sleeping eyelids leg will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. That is, it'll make a man or a woman, doesn't matter which, fall wildly in love with the next thing it sees. Okay? So, Puck goes. Oberon says, I'm going to put it to Tanya's eyes. And he says, and maybe, hopefully, she'll fall in love with a lion, a bear, wolf, or bull. Lion, bear, wolf, or bull. They're all what? Animals. Fairies aren't animals. Fairies are actually, you know, a little bit higher than humans. He's saying she'll fall in love with something beneath humans. Okay? So, what happens? Demetrius and Helena come in. And Oberon kind of does his Jedi mind trick and says to the audience, I am invisible. <laughs> they don't see me. You do. That is, the audience sees Oberon because he's still on the stage. And we see Demetrius and Helena come in. And we see Helena fawning all over Demetrius. And what does Demetrius say to her? Go away. Leave me alone. I don't love you. And he actually implies, hey, you know, I'm a strong, young Athenian man. You're a beautiful, young Athenian. I can do what I want. I could rape you. And she's like, oh, you never do that. You're too virtuous. You're too honest. You're too good. And he's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Go away. 
but she won't. Oberon sees that. And what does he tell us? Well, Puck comes back. <coughs> and Oberon says, line 245. We're getting towards the end of scene one. He says, fare thee well, nymph. Nymph. That's a forest goddess. He's just called Helena a goddess. Okay? You deserve better than this guy. He goes, here's what's going to happen. Now, he doesn't say that to Helena. She doesn't see this. She doesn't hear this. We, the audience, hear it. Before he leaves this grove, same language he used with his wife, thou shalt fly him, you will flee from him, and he will do what? He will seek your love. In other words, I'm going to turn the tables. He's going to know what it feels like to have unrequited love, okay? So Puck comes in, he says, here's the flower. Puck says, give it to me. Demetrius and Helena leave, okay? So Puck doesn't see Demetrius. Pretty important. And Oberon says, there's an Athenian youth wandering around in this forest. Find him, make him fall asleep, and then put this juice in his eyes. So that when he wakes up, he will see this young Athenian woman and fall badly in love with her. Cool. Okay. Puck says, I'll do it. Oberon says, meanwhile, I'm going to go anoint Titania's eyes. So scene two, we see Titania come in. And she's singing with her fairies and such. <coughs> and her fairies lullaby her to sleep. Page 1564. She falls asleep. The fairies all fall asleep. And Oberon steps forth and puts the drops in her eyes. And says, line 33, What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and language for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, that is, these are all wild animals. Whatever it is you see, in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakes it is thy dear see love can transform what one sees into something beautiful okay lysander and hermia come in and we hear them talk and what does lysander want to do now some directors make this Really blatant. Lysander wants to sleep next to Hermia. He says, let's cuddle up. Why? Ooh, it's cold in the forest. And she's like, no, 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 Lysander. Maiden modesty. You know, you sleep over there and I'll sleep. He goes, you, you think I meant to lay? No, no, no. I didn't mean to lay with you. I meant let's lie down naked. And she goes, I know what you meant. You over there and I'll lay down over here. Okay. Line 59, Lysander riddles very prettily, she says. How much be shrew, my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. And she starts punning on the word to lie, as in to tell an untruth, as well as to be prostrate with. Okay? But gentle friend for love and courtesy, lie further off <coughs> in human modesty, etc., etc. And he says, Amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I. And then in life, when I end loyal time, that is, I will end my life when I end my loyalty to you. Well, how does the traditional English marriage ceremony end? Till death do us part. Okay? So, they fall asleep. Okay? Puck comes in. Now, what's the charge Puck's been given by Oberon? Find the Athenian youth, put the juice on his eyes. He says, hmm, here's an Athenian youth, and, and here's a maid. Must be the one, Oberon, and he puts the juice in Hermia's eyes. Excuse me, in Lysander's eyes. Demetrius and Helena come running in, shouting, 
Lysander opens his eyes, and the first thing he sees is Helena. So now Lysander left. Okay, remember what the problem was before? When Lysander, who loves Hermia, we had Demet Demetrius, who loves Hermia, and we had Helena, who loves Demetrius. Now Lysander no longer loves Hermia. No, he loves Helena. Everything's all candy wampus. It's all screwed up. Now, none of the right people love each other. No, Hermia does still love Lysander. So that part's still cool. Okay? He wakes up. Helena hears him when he says, Helena, nature shows art, etc. You're a goddess. Helena's like, don't say that. I mean, Hermia's right here next to you. Don't. And he's like, content with Hermia? No, I do repent, line 117 or so. I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. <coughs> Who will not change a raven for a dove? Okay. He's telling us something there about their physical appearance. Hermia has dark hair and probably dark skin. Helena, white, <laughs> blonde. And yet, one thing you have to understand, in Shakespeare's day, because of Queen Elizabeth, the notion of beauty, the ideal of beauty, wasn't just white. It was white. Look at the famous portraits of Queen Elizabeth. Her face looks like this white. Why? Because she powdered it. So put, like, white powder on you. That was the ideal of white. Not, you know, California tan white, but white, 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 okay? So we get this impression. The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the word that you're made. He's saying reason can determine what is made beautiful. What's he appealing to here? Not because of how his eyes are seen. He's saying, you fit the model that everybody else says is beauty. You're tall, lithe, willowy, blonde, sport, you know, white swimsuit model. Whereas Hermia is just the opposite of all those things. Helen's like, what the? Why are you doing this? Because she thinks he's playing a joke on her. Okay, she runs off, Demetrius runs off, Lysander runs off, who's left? Hermia is asleep. And Hermia wakes up. Help me, because she's had a dream. What's happened in her dream? Somebody has stolen Lysander's heart. Okay, act three. I'm gonna give five more minutes and then I'll give the quiz. Act three. Notice, we're still in the wood. Okay? What characterizes the wood? Lawlessness, anarchy, chaos. It's wild. Civilization is nowhere to be found. Okay? So we see Bottom and the other tradesmen come in because they're going to do a rehearsal in the wood. Why would they do a rehearsal in the wood? Before they do it for the wedding, okay? But why in the wood? Why not do it in Athens? Well, they need to see it. Yeah, they don't want anybody to see it. They don't want any spectators, okay? So, they start putting on the play, and there's a scene where Bottom, in his character as Pyramus, has to go off stage. So he goes off stage. Who is on the stage? Other than them. Puck and Oberon. Okay? I think Oberon's there. No, Oberon comes in later. Puck. So what does Puck do? <coughs> he transforms Bottom's head 
into that of a jackass. He doesn't transform bottom entirely into one. That his bottom doesn't come back out on the stage with a donkey's legs and hooves and a tail. It's just the head. He's got the rest of his body. That's his. But the head is different. Okay? How do we know? Because bottom doesn't know what's happened to him. If his hands had turned into hooves, he'd know pretty quickly. Something's wrong here. So he comes back on the stage, and his friends, the other actors, are all totally amazed, and they run fleeing. And he's like, I, I get it. They're trying to make an ass of me. That's an example of dramatic irony, by the way. He says something that he doesn't realize the truth of. Okay? Now, who else is on the stage? Titania, sound asleep. So Bottom comes in, and to calm himself, he starts to sing. Now, I've seen this done a couple of different ways. I've seen it done many different ways, because I've seen this play, I don't know, quite a few times. The best way is when Bottom sings, and he sounds like when I sing. Those old cocks are black of you with orange on you. Know. In other words, he doesn't sound like a good singer. Why is that important? Because that awakens to Tanya. And notice she says, what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? See, the voice of an angel is supposed to be the voice of rapture. It's something that would remove you from yourself, almost. That's not bottom. I, I miss the days of black courts because I used to do this. That's Bottom's voice. Okay? And he keeps singing. And she says, I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. My eye is enslaved to your form. And we go back to what Helena said the eye can do. It can take something base and vile and transform it into something with form and dignity. You don't get more base and vile than half human, half animal. And not even half animal like, you know, a majestic horse or lion. A jackass. So she says, I do love Bottom, methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. In other words, now if you were to stop and think about this, mistress, you would say, that doesn't make sense. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. Reason and love keep little company. What does he mean? They should be like neighbors. House here, house here. Neighbors, he's suggesting, should be friends because they live in close proximity. Well, reason is up here. Love is right here. They're in fairly close proximity. They should work together. And he says, and they don't nowadays. He's implying they used to. Okay? Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Most people take her line, thou art as wise as thou art beautiful, to be somewhat ironic. How beautiful is he? To those of us who have not had our eyes anointed, he's ugly. But she has had her eyes anointed. She sees through the eyes of love. And therefore, she says, thou art wise. Is there wisdom in what he says? Should reason and love go together? That is, should love kind of make sense? Yeah, it should. Which is why you'll, you know, hear people go, don't, don't, don't do that. You're only going to get hurt. She's, he's outside your league, you know. Whatever the phrase goes. And what often happens? Right. You're going to get burned, okay. So, Bottom says, no, I'm not wise, I'm not beautiful. And he says, and if I were, I would find a way to get out of this wood. That is, if I were wise, I'd find a way to get out of this wood. He doesn't know what's happened. 
to his head. And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. You are not leaving. Mm -mm. You are mine. That is, she's enthralled to his shape. He's enthralled to her will. And in all, 95%. 95% of the stories from the Middle Ages that deal with fairies or elves, when they have interactions with humans, it's for one purpose, sex. They want to take humans and take them back to their fairy land for sex. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. And we're going to pick up with scene two on whatever day that is, Friday. And hopefully get a, through a whole lot more. All right, the quiz. Uh, before I answer, <coughs> We've gone over several things that are on the quiz. So hopefully you will be fresh in your memory, or you have really good eyes and can make out what's still on the board. <coughs> and I've got to point out one error, so you've got to fill in one word. Put everything away. <coughs> And this is pretty much the form the Queen's of Wolf case. Numbers five slash six, there should be two blanks. So it should read a Midsummer Night's Dream has two settings, locations, blank and put the other one in two. That's why it's worth two points. Um, numbers eight and nine, there should be the word loves before Lysander. So it's blank loves Lysander, whereas blank loves Demetrius. So just fill in those two blanks. Blank loves Lysander, whereas blank loves Demetrius. Number 10 is um, just a stupid error on my fault, because if you answer 5, 6, you've got one of the answers for number 10. Um, extra credit should be fairly clear. Sorry, number 3 is not worth 2 points. It's just worth 1 point. <clears throat> And when you're done, just turn it in and you are free to go.